Uh, would you like me to cool okay thank you very much lizzie that was fantastic nice introduction um evening everybody um welcome thanks for joining us uh, my name is andy dibbon i am head grower at abbey home farm in gloucestershire near sirencester um and i'm yeah passionate about my agroforestry and i'm passionate about my organic veg growing i've been an organic veg grower for 15 years um, and over the, I've been at this job for nine years, and over the last six of those nine years, we've been establishing a agroforestry system in field scale horticulture um, over a sort of five, six acre uh, rotation in on field scale. So through that experience, I've learned absolutely loads. I knew very, very little when I designed my system. Through the process, I got really into the subject, learned loads and loads. And maybe most importantly, I learned loads off other people who very generously shared knowledge. And I would like to continue that process and share the knowledge that I learned from those people while I was designing my system. And the last little thing that I always think about designing systems is I really believe in empowering people to design their own systems. I think each farm is unique and the people who grow on that farm or farm on that farm, they know what they only they know how their land behaves and what it needs from trees and what trees can bring to their farm so i love empowering people to design their own systems which is what this evening is all about and it's a fantastically enjoyable creative process designing a system so ben over to you thanks andy yeah so uh, i'm ben ben raskin my main job is at the soil association where i am head of horticulture and agroforestry so this tonight's webinar seems seen sort of perfect made for me um, uh, and I have a background in commercial veg production. Andy and I actually first met when we were both working at the community farm near Bristol. Uh, I got interested in agroforestry about 10, 12 years ago, uh, initially rented a couple of acres near Bristol and set up a small horticultural agroforestry um, set up that the landlord then went bust and I had to move all the trees. And it was all very upsetting at the time and I've got over it now, but um, I learned a lot through that, uh, particularly about not planting trees on rented land, uh, but we can talk about that maybe. Um, and I also currently project manage a uh, agroforestry planting at Helen Browning's 1500 acre farm near Wiltshire, which is mostly not horticultural, although um, a lot of the trees are fruit and nut crops. Um, so that's more of a silver pastoral um, system. Uh, and then um, I've also do a bit of writing, so I've written the Woodchip Handbook, um, and Andy and I are currently working on a uh, agroforestry, horticultural agroforestry book, <laughs> due out, we hope, uh, next year if we manage to write it. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, what we're going to do tonight, is not, it's not a um, sort of presentation with lots of slides, it's a conversation between me and Andy and hopefully yourselves. Um, so we will try and sort of draw questions in throughout the whole time. So don't sort of wait to the end to ask questions or, you know, if what we're talking about sort of prompts something, then just, yeah, stick it in the Q&A and um, we'll try and draw as many of those into the conversation as possible. Uh, broadly speaking, we're going to have three sections to that conversation. There's going to be a, a first bit around site um, assessment. And there's going to be a bit around objective setting and then the final section will be around the interactions between the trees and the crops um, and obviously you know this is uh, as i'm sure you all know it's a huge subject we will you know we, we won't be able to cover everything it'll be scratching the surface of a lot of this stuff but hopefully we'll take you through you know what we've learned in terms of setting up um, and designing systems anything i've missed there andy or does that sound all right uh, I think it sounds great, Jen. Ben. Time to sort of get stuck in, isn't it? Exactly. So um, let's start right at the beginning, uh, Andy. And um, when you, well, you know, when you're looking at a new site, or you're taking on a site, or you're thinking of developing your site, what's the first thing that you look for? You know, where's where's your starting point? I think this is a particularly relevant point to start with. I think a lot of agroforestry is very trendy at the moment, <clears throat> so you find a lot of people just want to do agroforestry for agroforestry's sake and work out how it goes in. I think that's um, it's a great way of finding out about it, but the, the real magic is when you realise what an amazing problem-solving technique agroforestry is. So where I always start in many ways isn't with specific trees or end crops or anything like that. If, I, if someone asks for my advice or where I started with my own system, 
is I walk into an empty field and I look at the, the natural uh, sort of the natural um, attributes of that field as a blank field or with the crops that are in it already, depending on the situation. And I ask myself, what problems might exist in this field that I can solve with trees? So you can solve many, many problems with trees before you even get into varieties. There's a whole host of problems that trees are a multifunctional tool in the landscape, especially with um, all the things being thrown up with climate change. So, and when you say problems, what, do, what, what are we talking about? What, do you, what have you got in your mind? Well, I think as a, as a horticulturalist, there are lots of things that, you know, weather, as always, in farming is a major thing and, and problems with weather come in in lots of different ways. So uh, for me, the main reason I put in a system on, on my holding, well, not my holding, but the holding where I work, is was wind. I've got this one field, it's, it grows lovely, lovely veg, but it really gets hammered by wind. And trees are the number one tool and probably the cheapest tool for creating a really, really effective windbreak. So that's one of the problems you can solve with that. There's soil erosion. So soil erosion can be caused by that wind. So in a very dry summer, you can lose your topsoil by strong winds going across your dry, dusty land. But you can also use, lose soil washing down the hill in heavy rainstorms and washing out your gate. Now, again, woodlands, hedgerows, these are probably the best tools available for managing extreme runoff and soil erosion off, off fields, basically. Um, the other ones uh, which we experience a lot is maybe less so on slopes. So flooding on flatter grounds, if, or if you're in low area and you're, you're experiencing extreme flooding in current weather conditions, trees can be a really good way of alleviating that flooding. They keep the ground aerated and fractured at all times. And that, in many ways, trees are, are nature's natural soakaways. So we can use them to alleviate flooding and sort of recover from flooding more quickly. And just these huge rainstorms we're getting at the moment, you know, everyone's getting them, um, you know, around trees, that water disappears way, way quicker. And then just like we had a few weeks ago, there's the opposite, which is intense sunshine. Now, certainly for me last year, there are periods in the last growing season where I, I was craving dappled shade across all of my vegetable cropping. And again, trees are the perfect tool for doing this. So alleviating floods, um, providing shade in intense um, summer heat and things like that. And the last thing, so I do think it's important because it gets left out a lot, but there's, there's all of these advantages in many ways can be applied in the same way and in extra ways in urban environments. So it's not always about walking into an empty field, you might be walking into a community allotment in the middle of the city. Uh, visual screening is great from trees. Uh, managing runoff of developed areas is really, really important. Um, dealing with air pollution in really built up areas, trees can help do this as well. And in a nutshell, these days, my catchphrase is, um, I think the most important tool that agroforestry is gonna be, and for me, it's not gonna be about increasing my yields massively, I think agroforestry is one of the best tools for maintaining yields in the face of an ever hostile climate, because we're finding you're, basically you're bringing you're bringing resilience on you in a way with that climate change. So, you know, all of that's we're getting more extremes of, as you say, <laughs> rain, dry, you know, all of those periods are longer, heavier, drier, hotter. Um, and and, you know, trees, even all of that stuff out of it. And, and so, yeah. enable, as, as you say, you know, in theory, they increase productivity, but in reality, with climate change, it might just be maintaining that. Yeah, that and, and, and resilience is definitely the word. Not to use Boris Johnson too much, but flattening the curve is essentially what you're trying to do and take off the extremes of, 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 of uh, intense weather. Yeah. So, so you've got a, you've got your <coughs> your problems listed, um, and I you know I can't believe any grower hasn't got a list of problems they're trying to solve. Um, so what's what's your next step as you're looking at the field? So that's all that's you could almost make that the first things I talked about, you could almost look over the hedge at a field and kind of assess that, you know, that, that's about slopes, exposure to the wind, all these things. Then I want to get through the gate. I want to get into the field and I want to get my hands dirty. So I want to know what the soil's like. So slightly more into detail then. So basic soil type, um, pH of soil depth of topsoil these are all things that 
they're not complete game changers, but they can influence your um, they can influence your planting technique, your choice of trees, and things like that. You can you can grow trees that like more slightly more acidic soil and slightly more alkaline soil, but they'll obviously thrive in a better soil. Depth of soil is really important. So what we found on our farm, we've got about 15 centimeters of topsoil and stones mixed. And then we've got under that, you're into about 80% stone and subsoil. So essentially we've got about 15 centimeters of, of nice friable soil we can plant into. So with the joy of hindsight, apples can cope with that absolutely fine. Pears hate it. And I read about that before I planted the pears and the pears did exactly what it said on the tin and that is struggle and get every pest in the book. So yeah, you, you, you can, it can define your choice of trees, those soil type things, pH as well, soil health. So if, you're, if, you, if you've just taken over or rented the corner of a heinously abused arable field, that's been, you know, every bit of nutrient and soil structure has been removed from that field. I wouldn't immediately plant a tree into soil that was heavily, heavily compacted. So, you, you know, you want to take a longer term approach to it and you might well want to alleviate some soil damage before you went into planting. Without digging a few soil pits and having a good look and getting your hands dirty, you won't know whether that's happened. Um, and the other sort of things you want to be aware of, so that's the soil side, but just general things like altitude, local climate, you know, is it coastal? Are you, you know, are you halfway up a hill? You know, we're not talking about growing coffee or anything like that, but like in a UK uh, environment, those things will affect what you're growing. And they, the, the key things there will be wind speeds, um, light levels you're going to get if you're in the bottom of a valley and, and you're going to get frosts later if you're in deep shade in the spring quite a lot. Um, and then the last thing about the landscape scale of things is potential pests. So the big ones we're probably talking about here really are deer, rabbits, squirrels. The, those populations might well define tree choice, but more importantly, they'll define what protection and what system you're going to use. They'll be part of your design process. I'm very glad to hear, Andy, that, that like me, you read the advice about what to plant, ignored it, planted the tree anyway, and then realized it was right. I did the same with cherry trees on wetland and, you know, yeah. the wettest end of the field, they've just disappeared. The drier end, they're just about okay. Yeah. <laughs> but but it is interesting because I, I think it, the, there is an element of listening to advice and, and doing the research, but you, I think it's also worth pushing the boundaries you know and and we've planted for instance at Eastbrook we've planted almond trees on you know on heavy clay in North Wiltshire in a flat site you know it's not and and they're doing pretty well um and and what I found interesting this year we've got the the biggest crop that we've we've had today it's still not a big crop but what seems to have happened is that the lower end of the field which I'm guessing was just a little bit colder uh we haven't got any fruit on there so all the trees blossomed but there's no there's no nuts the yeah. top end and that's and it's not you know it's a flat field so it's, it's that much difference um yeah. but it's that seems to have just been the difference between them pollinating and setting or not um, i mean that's like you say ben i mean and, and joking aside and i don't want to get all doom and gloom on it but today's bog might well be tomorrow's desert and that might happen quite quickly so planting you might well be planting you've got to have half a mind on this if you're if you've got an area of the farm that is really, really wet and you just fill it with things that drink water really heavily and grow veg amongst it, that might not be working for you in 10, 15 years time. But that it's impossible. You, it, you have to just hedge your bets a little bit on tree choice there, I think. Diversity yeah. is always is the key. And there's just on that note, um, Kate just put a question in. So they've got, uh, you know, they're putting in a one hectare field with rows of trees along the veg beds, but they've got a, wet patch and a dip in the field uh and thinking of putting in a row of willow um and asking for sort of whether there's any other suggestions for trees that don't mind uh wet feet um you know giving the example for instance that sweet chestnut don't like uh, wet feet cherries don't like wet feet but certainly yeah willow alder is good alder loves, i mean alder is great we so say we went we deliberately went for alder i i would be careful of willow I, I think if you're going to put willow in amongst cropping areas, you don't don't put too much. Maybe interplant it with other stuff. 
the, the, the research, the, the very little research about when I designed my system, the one thing that was around that had really good long term was weight cleanse. And the one thing I took out of that was the negative impact of willow on potato yields in dry years. And we're talking about dry years that would have seemed like wet summers now. So it, it, it's you've got to yeah use it interplant it don't go too heavy um and like you know if you get, the other thing is you know ben you always say this if if in the future it does that the wet bit does just turn into a lovely dry bit and the willows are sucking out too much moisture you can just get rid of them yeah you know, and, and put in something else the systems can morph with time basically. yeah and i think the beauty in a way of agroforestry as opposed to planting a you know a permanent woodland is you've got that opportunity to to tweak it and and if the tree isn't working it, you know then don't be afraid to to pull it out um and we've certainly noticed in a couple of our fields i mean similar to you i think kate we've we had a dip in one of our fields that for the first three years i was there flooded every winter it flooded and sat there wet since we planted the trees even though they're not very big yet it hasn't it hasn't flooded once so already that you know the the sort of water movement within that field has changed um but yeah, and, and I guess the other thing to say on willow is that there's different species, different varieties that have different vigor, you know, so so some of them might be more suited to horticultural systems than, yeah, than others. Beware of, beware of biomass willows, basically, which yeah. you'll get a lot of permaculture type kind of nurseries. A lot of the varieties they'll sell are biomass willows for good reason, you know, for, for producing lots of biomass, but that's not necessarily what you want in between rows of veg beds. And then just the last thing on that, to that question is, so the number of willows, space them out, you know, hedge your bets a bit. But the other crucial thing is distance between tree and veg. But what I think we'll come on to that um, on the last sort of section of this chat. Yeah. And I, and I think I might park the black locust question as well, um, Rachel, for that, for that last bit, but I have seen it. So, um, yeah, so you've, you've looked at soil, you've looked at altitude, all of that stuff. Uh, anything else you want to consider before you sort of start start going into designing? Yeah, there's a few more things. So one that's really, really important is land use. So I sort of touched on it about the soil health if you're taking over a really damaged field for some reason. But as, a sort of, as parameters, you want to know what the land use is. So that's historic, historic land use. You know, what's been used for the last 20 years? um current land use so are you where where are you putting in this system because obviously this is a huge question it's like are you putting it into a blank field and you can design your whole horticultural system at the same time as your agroforestry system as one sort of one smooth working organism or are you trying to integrate trees into an existing cropping system so there's a very very different design processes um they're covered by all the same parameters, but the starting point is obviously a, a, a key thing. Um, and if it is, if you are, the, the thing you've got to think about there, if you're integrating it into an existing system, are things like orientation uh, and aspect. So and I've seen this on a few places, and, and I've seen it stop people wanting to put in trees, is where you are currently cropping really, really happily in a east-west orientation and you you want to put in agroforestry and you're like well i don't want to change the whole field round so with my system we the first thing we did when we put in our system was empty the rotation into a different field and spent three years reorientating a field from east west production to north south production and that was the first part of putting in agroforestry so it's a key starting point there and yeah, and, and land use informs many things. If it's been a pasture for a very long time, it'll probably have really good soil, well, possibly, but quite likely, really good soil structure, good soil health, really good biology in the soil. If it's been cropping for a long time, either horticultural or all arable, it might have slightly less fertility in it. And you might want to think about that at planting. And yeah, yeah I mean, again, the orientation one's easy, uh, easy, interesting. I know we're going to cover it a little bit later, but um, but in your example, you know, there might be you you shouldn't let the fact that you can't do it north south stop you doing any agroforestry 100%. because because there's there's other ways potentially of, of designing the system. So. Uh, 
And as always, you know, there are two always. It's, it's a bit like when you're putting up a polytunnel. You want to go north, south, but you also want to go up and down the hill. Quite often you can't do that. And it's the same in agroforestry. You might want the trees to stop soil erosion on the hillside, but that means they go east, west. And it, it, only you will know on your unique holding or bit of land which of those tools you're really looking for the trees to do. And then you can design the system around that. So as well as as well as the field, um, you know, horticulture, I think agroforestry and horticulture gets slightly more complicated even than other systems because of the amount of other stuff that's going on, isn't there? You know, irrigation, crop protection, you know, you've got to do lots of other operations a lot of the time. Whereas in a arable system, for instance, you know, you, you're not necessarily going to be in there quite so often moving stuff about. How does that affect uh, you know, your, your sort of choice of system. And... It's a massive part of the design. Pro well, it, what it was for me, a massive part of the design process. So it's that systems approach thing. So everything, everything has to work symbiotically in perfect harmony. It never does, but that's what you aim to do. Um, and by that, what I mean is in, in many ways it comes down. It's actually just simple. It's just about maths and it's about what everything measures. So the things you need to measure and make sure they can interact seamlessly are irrigation width. So if you're using sprinklers or a boom or whatever irrigation you're using, you've got to think about how that's going to work with trees in the situation. Um, uh, crop meshes for crop protection. Again, you really want that to work. You don't want to end up having, when you have no trees in a field, crop mesh can just go side by side by side by side by side. When you put trees in there, suddenly if you don't, if you didn't think about it you could end up having half a mesh that's doing absolutely nothing uh because there's trees in the way and you can't pull it over the next crop mesh is really expensive so you need every square foot of mesh if you're using it to, to cover something you can't afford just to have bits down the side of the field so crop mesh irrigation tractor width or bed width so if it's not mechanized if it's market garden you know the the the, the distance between the trees will probably want to be a certain number of beds wide. Um, and the way you might define that is what's your rotation. You know, a really simple way if you're doing alley cropping is you use trees to demarcate rotation areas. And that works really nicely uh, as a system, or you might have three or four rows in a rotation area. But these are all the different things that sort of affect that. The other things that come into it are cultivation techniques. So when you're planning your system, you wanna know what, what your cultivation system is. If you're doing no dig, then you, you want to be thinking about how you're going to be stopping tree roots from migrating right into your no dig beds. Tree, and I think we'll talk about this later on, but root pruning quite often on a, on a current organic field scale is naturally carried out by cultivations in the field. Um, in a no dig system, you just, we've just had this happen to us in our glass house, actually. And we've had, we've got fan trained peaches and I hadn't started doing any root pruning. And we in they've been in this is their second year and they've definitely affected about five or six pepper plants and robbed loads of water off them so i can't again i knew about root pruning i forgot to do it and i got caught out by it so um yeah i should do what they say but yeah well, that's um, important thing to take into starting, account. starting early with the root pruning is then you know you're less likely to damage the tree if you you have to go in once it's got really big surface roots and you're there's more risk um of damage but yeah right so i think at that point ben we switch roles okay. so I, get to, I get to ask you a few questions now so let's get the sheets ready okay so we've got you've got <laughs> i've had the easy bit now we've gathered all of this information and, and there's a lot of information you can gather just from a site visit before you even sit down so when you do sit down, where on earth do you start? Especially if you're designing from scratch. There, you're a kid in a sweet shop. There's so many things. So where do you start? It's pretty daunting, isn't it? I mean, and when I started at Helen, you know, we had, you know, said, right, we've got 200 acres we're going to plant up. Let's plant some trees. And you go, okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, and I, I guess one thing I just wanted to add before we start on the design is particularly in horticulture, we tend to think of agroforestry as the straight lines and alleys. And, and that is probably mostly the right choice, but it's worth just sort of occasionally thinking that there might be other ways to incorporate 
trees into horticulture as well but um i think inevitably a lot of it will be focused on that but if if you if you want to ask questions or sort of have anything else tackled around sort of other systems and make sure you kind of pop something in the chat because i think there's a tendency for us to focus on rows and then um, just one last thing there's access you've got to be able to get in and out of the field with all your stuff yeah basically. yeah 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 so um so in terms of how you start that choice i think that the first thing and then bearing in mind that every tree will potentially deliver a whole range of benefits for you or, or help solve multiple problems that Andy laid out at the beginning. You know, they will increase biodiversity, they will alter water flow, they will create shade and, and shelter. You know, so all of these things are going on and, and also hopefully produce a crop of something, uh, potentially, whether that's, um, you know, whether that's a, a fruit or a nut or whether it's something to do with the, the timber itself. So the, the key bit is to is to start to narrow down um, that choice in a way. So so you're always going to end up with more more plants that you call more different trees that you could plant than than you've probably got room and or money for. Um, so it, it's sort of starting to think about what are the what's the most important thing for me. Um, so it might be that you really want to have some fruit to put in your box scheme, or you know, like Andy said, for him, you know, that wind was one of the, the key objectives. So, you know, you start to think, okay, so I want something that's going to produce fruit for the shop and reduce wind. So, you know, already you're starting to narrow down your choice a bit about, about what you want. And what, what I would suggest is that you group trees into, so at this stage, I wouldn't start to think about varieties or necessarily even um, species. So you might start to group them into quite general groups of trees. So it might be you're going, okay, I want fruit trees and at this stage that that's sort of as quite a wide one or you know nitrogen fixing trees would be another <clears throat> say you know or big trees for for wind control so you sort of in a way you start off with that you know these are the types of trees that I want to put in you know you might uh, you know one of the things we'll talk about in terms of that interaction between crop and tree you know there is a relationship between the height of the tree and the width of the row um, assuming that you want to continue cropping in between the trees um, and there is a there is a a way of using agroforestry as a transitional phase um, in in your planning so you can say well actually this is going to be a woodland at some point but I'm going to crop in between until the trees are big enough I think we'd mostly assume that this is going to be setting up a system that will continue to be a horticultural agroforestry system with crops and trees in which case, you know, you, you don't want some a tree that's so massive that it's going to shade out every crop and and stop you growing crops. So there might be a, you know, you might say, well, I need trees that are, you know, twenty foot tall or or you know, fifteen foot tall. So you might you might limit it actually by size. But starting to starting to look at those objectives, you might also you want to probably you know list all of them. So you know, it might be wind erosion, crop water you know you might end up with five or six objectives uh but then you want to prioritize them you know because you want it to deliver the maximum benefit to your system um you know so if your if your challenge is really is a you're just getting no pollination of crops and you want to bring more pollinators in then specifically choosing trees that are great for attracting pollinators might be your kind of your key objective um and then and then once you sort of got those broader groups I think then you can start to think about uh you know the markets potentially for those trees so so they're delivering a function obviously in themselves as trees within your system um but most trees uh, I mean I hesitate to say all trees uh because some I think might just work as as themselves but most trees will also have a product or a you know or something that can be marketed so I mean, so Ben, that's the key point. Isn't it? We've talked lots already about um, all that. There's all these different jobs that trees can do for you as a tool, and um, I think what what and we've both talked about lots of the benefits that tree that trees can bring to your, your horticultural operation. I mean, can we zoom in a bit more on like potential crops from trees and like really look at you know obviously there's lots of different kinds of apple and fruit but there are you can go well i think you'll tell us now that there are so many different options for end crops excuse me i just got quickly let a dog out of door in one yeah. second <laughs> so yeah so i think and and sometimes the way i look at this is actually working 
working out your market for crops. So, you know, there's there's an on-farm market effectively, you know, a, a kind of reducing inputs type market where, you know, fence posts, wood chip for no dig systems, um, you know, poles for growing beans up, you know, a lot of these things that you might have to spend money on buying these things in, you could be growing yourself. Um, and they're usually pretty easy to grow for that stuff. Um, you know, stuff like hazel, chestnut grows pretty quickly, you just coppice it and use the poles or you coppice it and, and wood chip it. You know, you don't have to be a, an expert forester to be able to get some value out of some of that lower grade timber. Um, the as as horticulturalists, most of us are used to producing and marketing a crop um, in a way that sort of some livestock farmers are not. So the idea of you know growing fruit or growing nuts and harvesting and selling it comes quite naturally. So so that's why you know I certainly think a lot of horticultural systems it works well <coughs> to have fruit and nut crops. Um, but there's uh, you know there's also big opportunities in floristry, um, in herbs, you know, there's, there's a lot of trees that will produce good herbal products. We're just um, at the moment doing a bit of a trial on sea buckthorn leaf, um, drying it for, for herbal teas. Um, there's there's medicinal stuff. I know, um, you know, growers that are drying dandelion roots and things, you know, and, and once you sort of get into the habit of thinking in that way, there's, there's lots of tree products, potentially ginkgo, lime um you know that you can perhaps coppice within a system and use the leaf or the flower um for that there's there's obviously timber uh you know it's slightly higher grade timber so um uh, you know cricket back willow is one example if you've got very wet soil where you know there's really good money for for a specific market or um i know andy you just come back from ireland talking about the hurley sticks yeah. from from ash um there's and ben, uh, just just on the Indian point, like we were saying on the day, you, you imagine there's not that many cricket bats here in England, but the export market to India is absolutely ginormous, and that's where they all go, and that's why it's always profit as a thing in agroforestry is that massive export market because they yeah. can't grow them in India. Although you know we did get the cricket bat company out to Eastbrook because we've got one field that's called Withy Pump which you would think would be really wet and it is really wet. And in fact, it's that field that I told you about earlier that had the dip. But when they came out, they said, oh, they're not really wet enough. You go, what? It's got windy yeah. pump. How could it not be wet enough? It was but, um, <laughs> Yeah, so, 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 but anyway, there is a particular market there, but there's also, I think, other opportunities to grow higher quality timber. Um, and it's something that I think farmers have stopped understanding i think that split between forestry and and farming has happened to the point where most farmers and probably most growers don't really know how to grow timber i certainly don't um you know and yeah i think historically the farmers would have known that um it's a longer it's a longer term crop clearly um you know stuff like cherry you might harvest after 40 or 50 years and oak you know might be 100 years so uh, and and will obviously get much bigger, so it might not suit horticultural systems. But um, but it's it's worth thinking about, particularly maybe at the edges of fields if you're looking for for more wind protection, um, sort of around the edges. Um, there's also uh, oh, the other the other sort of there's there's uh, things like as well, um, you know, if you do have livestock alongside horticulture, you could use wood chip for bedding. You could use the timber for your own buildings on farm. Um, you know, there was one farmer that basically chopped down one of his trees and made this incredible lintel that would have cost him 1500 quid if he'd gone and bought it. You know, so so although he might not have particularly grown it for that purpose, it was a great resource to to have on the farm. Yeah. Uh, and the other the other sort of big opportunity, I think, is around honey production. So we're doing this quite interesting um project looking at pollinators in agroforestry systems um, and and as climate changes there are some species that might become suitable so particularly manuka and, and kanuka which have these sort of incredible health benefits yeah. and historically haven't been that productive in this country might now be so um, yeah again sort of thinking a bit outside the box um, but also thinking about how much time you want to put into the tree crop um, you know, so growing some coppice and wood chipping it is pretty quick and easy. It will have some some use, uh, you know, or do you want to be, you know, then keeping bees and making your own honey or do you want to be drying herbs and selling a herb product? You know, there's 
there's potential there to make money, but you, it's a whole extra business and, and you may not have the time or the inclination to do that alongside what you're doing already. So, you know, really think about Sorry, go on, on that on that precise point, uh, with exactly what you said in there, it's seasonal time pressures, isn't it, with veg? So, honey, I imagine quite a lot of your time and effort is going to be at the same time as a lot of your time and effort on the veg field. So, it's yeah. just it's balancing the the seasonal demands of the now two crops in your system as such. Yeah, that's a really good point, and uh, you know there is potential to even out that that labour. You know, so so a lot of tree work is done in the winter. Um, yeah. So it is potentially a way of bringing extra income and, and being able to, for instance, have a full time employee rather than a seasonal employee. Um, but equally, as you say, you've got to be pretty careful. You know, you don't want all of your apples coming at the same time as your, you know, lifting potatoes. So you might choose a later variety, for instance, so that it doesn't clash with, you know, your key. And, and again, that comes into that kind of your when you're sort of working out objectives and looking at your, you know, your your machinery or your labor use and sort of mapping all of that out is really worth spending a bit of time on um, to make sure that you're you're not competing with your existing enterprise. And, and can feel um, that the storage qualities of some ap apples, I'm thinking in particular, but of tree crops enables you to maybe if, you, if you're on a smaller operation like a market garden where you might well run out of produce by the time you get to Christmas or, you know, early winter. You, you can have a storage crop of apples that tops your farmer's market stall up when everything else is sort of running out. You know, there's limited numbers of storage crops, especially storage crops per square metre. Apples rate pretty highly. Yeah, no, absolutely. So what else? I mean, so what, once we've started thinking about crops as such from trees, um, we're starting to dial in on which ones actually we want to use. What else do we need to start thinking about around so what else apart from oh i want to grow some nuts or i want to grow some apples what else needs to come into the um thinking about when you're introducing a new crop line well so i mean there's there's obviously an investment for all of this you know trees in themselves cost money to plant and and you know you you touched on the pest stuff um so there's a there's a sort of cash flow thing um and some crops you know so we planted for instance we planted all these almonds um we haven't really worked out yet how we're going to process them uh, and uh, you know at the moment we haven't you know last year we we had our 18 um, nuts from our 60 trees <laughs> um, so it wasn't exactly a problem storing them and processing them but you know at some point we hope to have enough that, that we might need to invest in processing capacity and for some crops that doesn't exist in the UK yet um, and so you know are you are you up for that you know or, or or you know do you want to juice your apples in which case um and i've just realized i haven't plugged my computer in and i'm about to run out of charge um <laughs> i could do a little quick of a segue there i think so it, it's interesting so on on that sort of reach the market thing of, of selling you know you grow this crop and where you sell it um when we were putting our system in and it, our system is very much based around when we were having, making this decision about what what can the trees they can do all the benefits to the crops but what you know many trees fill in that wind that will, will, will tick the wind benefit box anyway but when we started talking about apples we accepted we were going to go on a low input system and have and and you know we have no intention of ever spraying the trees ever we're, we're organic purists here at the farm so we'd never think about spraying them and we're not we're not going to do a really involved like pruning system or anything like that they're quite low input so we realised we we're going to get a lot of grade out, probably, or it's realistic to get a, a fair bit of grade out. But when we started looking into apple juice, actually, the e the, the economics of apple juice are not as um, positive as everyone thinks. It's not that much of a mar it's not that much of a profitable thing unless you own a great big press on the farm yourself. And normally, to pay that off, you've got to juice everyone else's apples as well. So we and and the other big thing is. People don't like feeding their kids fruit juice anymore because it's full of sugar. And that's changed that marketplace. It's, it's important to understand the intended marketplace, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's a good point. And, um, and there's a couple of questions actually about apples. I mean, I, I spend quite a lot of these sorts of events telling people not to plant apples, <laughs> um, for partly for, the, for those reasons that you said, partly because at the moment, anyway, there's a bit of an oversupply anyway. Now, 
that doesn't mean you should never plant apples. Um, and, you know, if you have your own box scheme or your own farm shop, I think there is definitely, uh, you know, a good opportunity to sell dessert apples into that market. Um, but I think, I think you're absolutely right. I think the juicing economics are, are pretty marginal um, and, and it is a slightly declining market. I think, you know, there's opportunities with cider if you can create a really good brand and make a really good cider. But again, it's it's not easy and it's a whole nother extra layer of, of business. Um, so there's a question about apple varieties for storage. I mean, what I would say in terms of choosing apple varieties is a fantastic website called Apple Pippin, uh, Orange Pippin, sorry. Yeah, and um, we've got loads of great information on varieties, you know, pollination time, storage, all of that stuff. Um, so um, we're we're grow we are growing one which I think is called non pare which is a sort of really late cropper. So we haven't grown many apples at Eastbrook, but <laughs> we were quite interested in some of those very late ones that don't need cold storage to survive through to the winter. Um, and then there was a, a question about the payback time on investment for apples. It depends a little bit, doesn't it, in terms of sort of your root stock and your system and. And your route to market, because, you know, the value of an apple is defined by your route to market. You know, if you're selling them out wholesale, it'll take you longer to pay off the money than if you're selling them direct sale. But again, it depends on the volumes you're selling wholesale. So there's lots of variables. But I don't know, Ben, if you can back this up. In my, in my head, if I remember rightly, the figure that I keep, keep quoting to the boss and promising is year 10, we hit commercial yields, which works really well as an excuse until you hit year 10. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, and the very, very modern commercial roots, you know, orchards on dwarfing rootstocks are aiming for fairly full production by year five or six. Um, but they're, you know, they're intensive and they're fertilizing them and irrigating them and all the rest of it. Um, I think Andy's right. I think, you know, expect some cropping from sort of year four or five and hope to sort of hit the peak at year 10. In terms of the payback on investment, you know, you're probably talking somewhere year eight to ten. Um, but but again, you know, it depends how much you're spending on them. And uh, you know, Andy and I both have very low input systems with our fruit. You know, I'm not even really doing as much pruning as I probably should. I'm letting them get on with it. If I get uh, a harvest one year, that's great. If I don't, I'm not too worried because they're delivering other benefits. And you know. I will end up, for instance, with the fruit, I'll almost certainly end up with a lot of bienniality, which for some people would be a real problem. If you've got to supply apples every year into your box scheme, that's a problem. For us, it's not so much of a problem. So sort of understanding, you know, what you want from that and, and how much you want to spend managing them. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question on investment, but I think it's, it's, it's that sort of time period. Um, there, was, there was also a question which said, just before we move on, Andy, about um, climate change affecting tree floration in the UK. And it's one that actually we've been talking about a lot as part of this pollination project and having a lot of back and forth about it. I'm not sure if it was on Farming Today or on, on the news. In the last couple of days, there's a, a, a big piece has come out about um, uh, bees coming out at different times and that mismatching with um, their natural pollen sources and stuff like that. So, yeah, I mean, like, or just with insects in general across the year, it, havoc is taking place with hatching times and all of that sort of stuff. And with, with yeah. uh, flowers, you know, weird things coming into flower in the autumn when they shouldn't do. Our summer raspberries keep flowering in the autumn. That's almost a regular thing now, is our summer raspberries doing a second flowering. So yeah, there's there's havoc all over the place. But I, 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 I just think that things fill niches. So I, interestingly enough, there's so much dialogue about honeybees all the time as pollinators. Now I see honeybees a bit pollinating my crops. I see bumblebees pollinating my crops all the time for a much longer season than honeybees. And I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not saying we should neonicotinoid all the honeybees, but I see when, when gaps are created in nature, other things move in. So even though climate change will throw things around, I think the thing about pollination is there are so many pollinators. You know, low, it's not just bees. You know, it's not just about collecting nectar. Most flying insects eat pollen to fuel their flight. So they will accidentally pollinate just by visiting flowers for, for that feed source. So I kind of feel stuff will fill in on that gap. 
the bigger and problem is, is rain. I've, I've, I've had terrible pollination this year on early black currants, uh, but great on apples. So yeah, uh, diversity is the key, both in cropping, but also in varieties of apple to make sure that some of the varieties do blossom at a good positive moment. Yeah, I was going to make exactly the same point. I think it's about it's all about diversity. You know, the whole point of the trees is bringing diversity into the crop. Uh, and then, you know, the more diversity you can get within within the species and within varieties, again, is, is really crucial. And, you know, the thing, even things like, uh, you know, apple scab, there are different strains of apple scab that are, that are sort of adapted for different varieties. So if you have, you know, an acre of discovery, scab will rip through that in a, in a few days. If you have different variety, when it when that scab that loves discovery hits you, non pare it'll go oh that's not quite right I, you know i don't know what i'm doing here and it slows down and you know some of it might then suit, but you, you effectively you can slow it down and the you know the other challenge we've had with pollination is is around you know because we're getting really quite warm springs often you know sometimes no frost or winter warm spring you know so our almonds were in blossom in february um but then may you get that kind of late hard frost and everything's thinks it's it's in june and so you know some of those unpredictable things are the things that are going to be challenging i think i think generally we are seeing a slight um early earlyingness no that's not the right word a slight um getting earlier each year of of flowering but it's not it's not sort of straightforward it hasn't moved from that to that it you know it's up and down and things are moving about and interestingly, Ben, what we've definitely noticed here, and I think this spring, early spring is a really good example of it, is actually there's a negative side to getting early, dry, clear days, and that is late frosts. So yeah. with those clear days on the short day length, it's not good news. So it might be sunny by day and be great for growing an apricot, but you're going to lose the blossom every night when the frost comes in. So yeah. that that's the, you know, sunshine doesn't always mean hotter. It can mean colder as well. Yeah, yeah. And there's, I mean, there's the great point by Fajoles about, um, is it common policy to keep detailed florida floration calendars? And I would say it's not common practice, but it's probably quite a good idea. <laughs> it is, it is, I better start doing it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, and yeah, so we'll come on to that probably. Uh, I'm just trying to have a quick look at the other. Uh, so um, Rita and Adam have asked about catching up on rented so definitely and um, lizzie i'm very happy for you to share contact details or we can stick them in the chat if people want to get in touch i'm assuming andy you're the same um yeah 100 percent uh <clears throat> so da, 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 da. fertilizer topic obviously depends on soil and historic use this is philip um but in general what do you suggest considering in terms of tree support and what's generally worthwhile doing inoculation with fungi wood chip on surface manuring outset should we maybe cover that a little bit I'm just thinking um, there's a kind of there's a whole establishment planting bit that maybe we'll if we've got time, we'll come to it at the end. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. It, so if you don't mind too much, but it will part that one, I think, and hopefully come back to it. Um, we could do a quick step by step on it, couldn't we? Yeah. I mean, it feels almost like a whole other webinar as well. Um, then there's a risk that we sort of get really into the into the management and protection which is obviously crucial but but i think yeah. we're trying to focus on the design uh, we, yeah. yeah the design today so um and then <clears throat> i guess you know i think this is probably linking a little bit into our next question andy which is around into planting fruit trees with soft fruit bushes within the rows um, yeah i mean so i mean just just to finish off that section was like was we were going to talk about how you actually put all of that stuff we've talked about how you actually put it into a plan you know, on the, on the ground as such. So you've got you've, you've acquired all the information you need. That still isn't um, a plan, is it? No, and I think in a way that's the fun bit, isn't it? Once you've yeah. got got the stuff, um, you know, and whether you whether you're working on paper or something like the land app, which has you know got kind of you know digital ways of mapping this stuff out. A lot of it is just starting to play around with spacings, um, and you know, another way that I've, I've quite like working is cutting out sort of bits of card you know to represent a tree row and a, a bed width for instance and you can see well what happens if i have three bed widths or or five yeah. you can sort of start to mess around and it's um you know i know andy we've been talking about as part of the book we've been looking at how you uh how you sort of calculate 
the, the optimum height of a tree according to the row width than what crops you're growing and it gets quite complicated um so one one option which we've done in one of our fields is actually to plant at double the spacing that you want so say you decide you know say you sort of get to the point you go okay well i think i want my tree rows uh you know 12 meters apart which is going to be i don't know four bed rows or whatever and you but, but you're not sure if that's right and you're a bit nervous well actually do them at 24 meters apart or 26 or whatever and then you can always stick another tree row in between at a later date so it gives you flexibility to try some of this stuff out without committing yeah. yourself I mean, that's really relevant that's exactly what we did so and funny enough when we designed our plan um it was it was quite close it basically our irrigation boom is 16 meters wide so it's just over that and that was going to water the trees and we mapped out the whole field um, me and the owner, Hillary, walked around and sort of put, put stakes in the field and things like that, mopped it, mopped it all out. And she was, she was a little bit taken aback because suddenly, when she could see it in the, you know, in, in the reel, it was a massive change to the landscape. And the cafe looked straight out over this field. And what she thought was going to be this really beautiful, she suddenly thought, actually, it's going to be quite dominating in front of a, a beautiful open thing. So we ended up going in at a third of the spacing we originally planned so and we tweaked a few things we had a few denser bits but we backed off on the original plan and actually i really like it it still ticks all of our boxes all of those problem solving boxes but it keeps it a bit more open and airy you know so um yeah it's good i think i think your point about um about marking it out in the field is really is important as well because you know you do it on paper and it you know and then actually you start putting stakes in the ground and it you go oh that's not what i thought it would look like and, <clears throat> and what happens you know it, the other thing to do if you do have trees within your existing field that you're going to do it is actually go and stand next to them at certain times of day and see where the shade falls or, or you know map an area put some poles in and see at what point in the morning they they come out of shade and into sun and vice versa you know and, and you can say oh okay, yeah actually that's too tall or we need to be further away or we need shorter trees so so seeing seeing how trees interact in in real life as well as as well as that kind of on paper or digital design yeah and ben the thing that i actually forgot to say at the beginning about assessing sites is, is very similar to that but it's the real world learning from the real world on the site is taking a really good note of what trees are growing naturally in the area that that for us was a real key leading thing so i said i said two i think two thirds of our hardwood trees not fruit trees were coppice varieties we picked them and I, i'm happy to speak about choice we, we spit we chose hazel and alder because of the length of cycle on the cuts matched our veg rotation um but the biodiversity trees were the other third we we're not going to cut them we're not going to do anything never harvest them maybe the odd the odd thing off them but they were spindle cherry and elder and that is what just packs the hedgerows and the woodlands around that veg field. So we knew they'd work well. We knew they'd, they'd interact with local biodiversity well because they're already the basis of that local biodiversity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess once you've got, you know, and, and it's in a way, it's a little bit like vegetable rotations, you know, you kind of, there is no perfect one. Uh, it's always going to be a you know a, a guess as to what's going to work the difference is with a vegetable rotation you can change it every year uh, yeah. and, and tweak it once trees are in the ground i mean you know we've said you can take them out again but they're you know they're fairly permanent and they're certainly there for a, a few years until you know whether they work so so being a little bit you know if you're worried being a little bit cautious uh you know not planting quite so many trees or planting them further apart i think is probably quite a good idea um, and then the other bit that, that I've had various sort of thoughts and conversations and trials about comes back to um, Tom's question about the interplanting, which is um, the, 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 the other thing about agroforestry in a way is it's, it's a sort of simplified commercial version often of permaculture or the sort of very diverse natural systems. Um, so you're trying to get as much diversity in, but equally you've got to make it manageable and work within a 
commercial veg operation. Um, so one of, you know, we initially looked at having our, our central tree row with fruit bushes on either side of it. So you sort of end up with this triple layer. But then we suddenly thought, well, hang on, we've got to manage that understory. And if we've got gaps between the soft fruit and then how do we get to the top fruit? And then if we're shaking fruit down, that's all going to collapse. And, and in the end, what we decided was to do exactly what Tom suggested, which is we've got, you know, our two main trees with a fruit bush or number of fruit bushes in between. So for a lot of our system, that's how we've done our alleys. We've got, you know, what will be a big tree and that will vary depending on the tree. So we've got one in one of our fields, we've got peri pears. You know, we've got them 10 metres apart. They're going to be big trees. Um, you know, they're going to hopefully live for 250 years. Um, so, so we space them wide. Um, and then we've got willow and alder that we've interplanted. <laughs> and again, we haven't got veg in that field, so we haven't got the sort of concerns about willow. We'll coppice that willow and alder or possibly browse it at some point. Uh, and at some point, they'll probably just give up the ghost as the, as the pears get big. In other fields, uh, we've got a much more diverse system with lots of different top fruit and, and soft fruits. And we've got, you know, almonds interplanted with raspberries. We've got apricots interplanted with gooseberries. We've got quinces interplanted with sea buckthorn. Although because the quinces haven't done as well as we thought and the sea buckthorn's done better, we've actually got sea buckthorn interplanted with quinces. <laughs> um, so some of that, you know, again, is, you know, you don't know what's going to do well in your site. And I just, I had no idea the sea buckthorn was going to get that big. And I didn't know this quince was going to be quite as rubbish as it was. So um, there's a lot of trial and error um, in some of this. Um, but I don't, you know, I know um, Tolly's done quite a bit of, you know, rhubarb in between some of his trees. So I think, you know, if, if your if space is limited, you want to pack as much productive stuff into it as possible so i definitely think interplanting trees is a really good way of using that space cut flowers bulbs are a cut natural flowers. natural understory yeah. and yeah tulips and dafts are good sellers especially on a farmer's market stall yeah um and there's also there's a question about specific seed mixes under the row which i think i can't remember if we're going to come on to later but um you know that it comes down a little bit again into establishment and there's and there's choices you can make about how you're going to manage the understory um but i think if you're going to have a uncultivated bit then uh, i would say planting a low um vigor you know seed grass mix is is a quite a good way of, of managing an understory what have you done with yours i can't remember my my system is perennial wildflowers yeah. So we're in, and it's always obviously interesting. And and the key thing, this is so important to remember with understories. And I'm I'm slightly waiting with bated breath. So I'm on year five on some of the rows, year six of since I sowed that perennial thing. So far, it's still dominantly perennial wildflowers. No management. We never cut it. We never do anything. So it's not like a wildflower meadow. We just leave it. It's tall. It comes right up under the trees, almost touches the bottom of the apple trees at the height of the season. It's humming with insects all the time. We put it in as, as um, integrated pest management. So for predators, for the surrounding veg crops, and uh, so pollen source and habitat, uh, 12 months of the year, essentially. Um, but I am expecting succession to occur at some point. But the important thing there is whatever you do underneath your trees, depending on what the tree mix is, that is going to evolve. So, you know, that to start with, your trees will cast dapple shade or no shade when they're tiny, then dappled shade when they're medium size. But there will come a point where they'll cast heavy, heavy shade. And most trees, when they get big, they dominate what's underneath them. They steal the water from what's underneath them. They steal nutrients. You know, it's not often in woodlands. You go into a woodland, like a beech woodland, nothing grows under a beech tree. Nothing. It's the dominant species. But when that beech tree starts to grow, yeah, you can grow all kinds of things next to it. So it's important that you, you envisage and plan for the understory, just as you do for the size of the tree. That it might start off as um, something that needs lots of light when you've got big gaps between the trees but it might evolve into soft fruit 
stage two when you need something that tolerates um, a little bit of shade, basically. So it's, it's yeah, and I, just but I mean, you're absolutely right about it evolving. But I would say in the in an agroforestry setting, particularly the alley setting, is never going to be as dense as that beach. So, so I think you know, there's <clears throat> most stuff will grow in semi shade. Um, so I think there's I think there probably I mean, it depends. It does depend on what tree you've planted and how big it gets and all the rest of it. But, you know, for, for a lot of these systems, you know, the picture behind me on which is um, Fred Bonnestrew's place at um, Close Farm, you know, those apple trees are not going to get much bigger than they are at the moment. You know, he could be if he wanted to, he could be growing stuff in between them. Yeah. Um, you know, he, he doesn't. And, you know, that's, that's a decision. We reference your point, Ben. I know for a fact that Fred really wishes that there was slow, less vigorous grasses underneath those trees. Yeah. Because he has to pay someone to mow underneath them a lot because it's quite vigorous, the grass. Yeah. And then we've, you know, in terms of that site assessment, you know, we've got one field where we've got the peri pears actually, where we, we had a discussion about should we cultivate the strip and sow a less vigorous or a wildflower mix. We decided it was because it's really heavy as well, really heavy soil and difficult to manage and cultivate. We decided it was going to be too expensive and too difficult. So we just planted into the existing um, understory, which has a lot of creeping thistle in. So we now have rows that are trees and creeping thistle, um, which, you know, is it's a grazed rotational graze system so it's it's not as much of a problem for us as it would be in a horticultural system but you know if that was if that was a horticultural site that would be a disaster <laughs> you know you so so really knowing what's in your soil and if you have got particularly perennial weed problems um they will continue under trees and they will continue even if you mulch them heavily um you know so so that's something to be aware of in terms of and, and we, we've we've had that problem, Ben. In fact, we've we've had creeping creeping thistle coming out of the tree rows, and we're kind of again in in rotation, designing ways of managing that naturally within the system. But and we did do the first thing. So we reorientated the field, but the summer before we plied the trees, we knew where the trees. That so the the season before the winter we plied the trees, we weeded the tree lines all summer. And there's two reasons for that, weeding, but we knew we were going to put in wildflowers. So we actually exhausted and leached out a bit of nutrient for those wildflowers to go in. Um, in interesting, we've really noticed that some of our trees are in beetle banks, which are just grasses, tusky grasses. Some are in perennial wildflowers. The perennial wildflowers, where there's 47 different species, uh, hold creeping thistle at bay way more than beetle bank mixes which are about three or four grasses so that, and, and i do this and i do weed presentations diversity is one of the key things that combating yeah. perennial weeds so yeah. don't put monoculture underneath the trees and expect it to suppress anything yeah well i don't know our monoculture of creeping thistle suppresses pretty much everything else <laughs> but but it's interesting actually because you know although you know i'm sort of joking about it the creeping thistle doesn't compete with the tree no. In the way that grasses will. So, um, you know, it's quite deep rooting. It goes down. It doesn't seem to have an adverse effect. And it obviously dies down every year. So we're getting quite a lot of organic matter added. So so it's not it's not affecting the trees, but it would definitely affect, uh, you know, the... Well worth some pre, pre-crop pre weeding, like any crop. Yeah. You're better off doing the weeding before the crop goes in than trying to do the weeding after, especially with perennial weeds, especially with perennial weeds. Absolutely. And there's a there's a good point um, from Tom again, you know, could poultry help manage understory growth? But, and, uh, you know, <clears throat> poultry and or other livestock, I think, you know, both Andy and I are really interested in the role of livestock. I remember at the community farm, Andy, slightly against my better judgment, introduced a load of piglets under our tree rows. Um, but, but, you know, actually they work really well. You kept them moving. They were, they were very small. They did, you know, they, they I can't remember. I, 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 the fact that I was, I, I kept them timely moving at that time seems unlikely, but I, yeah, hopefully I did. But that's why I always say timing's so important. Yeah. Anywhere <laughs> with livestock on, on veg or trees, they can be amazing tools, but you've got to move them when they need to move. Yeah. And even poultry, if you've got enough of them, they can cause 
you know, they will cause damage to that soil if you leave too many for too long. But yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, poultry are, are great. And in one of our fields where, you know, if anyone's listening and wants to start a poultry enterprise in North Wiltshire, do get in contact because we're looking for someone to bring poultry. We've got, you know, we've got a site that has been designed exactly for that and to be able to move poultry around. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely worth doing. Um, the other bit, which comes back a little bit to the black locust question earlier from Rachel. Um, so I do have a load of black locust at the moment in pots waiting to be planted out. <laughs> it's slightly controversial in terms of it, sort of potential invasiveness. And definitely there are some people that are, don't like it because it's not native. I think we need to slightly get over our fears about native because with climate change, I think if we just stick to native, we'll, you know, we'll lose everything. So. So I'm, I am really interested in black locust. I think it's, you know, yes, it's nitrogen, fit, nitrogen fixing, as you point out. It's potentially a brilliant fence post um, tree. It's, it, there's a, apparently a saying in, the, in America that, you know, where, how do you know when, you, when it's time to replace your fence post when they're made of black locust? Well, you put a stone on top of the post and when the stone disintegrates, it's time to change your, your fence post. So they're supposed to last, you know, forever. But, you know, in a horticultural system, they suck at and spread. Um, and that could be a problem. Um, so, you know, there are some species, again, actually, some of the things like the almonds and the apricots that we've got are, are suckering as well. Um, and that, you know, for us, that's not a huge problem. But in a horticultural system, that could yeah. cause you some real difficulties. They say, interestingly, Ben, the one that and I'm a little bit, I knew it is again, I knew it before I planted it. But they say that one of the things you've got to watch out for with prunus species, so, you know, apricots, peaches, nectarines, is even if you root prune, they can have a desire to, like, come back up to the surface at distance. So yeah. we, we've slightly got our radar off about that, about the peaches we put in our glass house. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. So I think that brings us on to our final sort of discussion I mean we have talked about some of this anyway um yeah we, just, so, we can paraphrase it can't we around time leave a bit of time for questions Ben yeah 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 exactly um so I guess the you know the, this final bit we were we were talking in a way about the the complications in a way of a, of a horticultural system as opposed to some other agroforestry systems which might be a little bit easier um so so it's kind of you know we've got to the point now i know you haven't tonight but you know in theory we've got to this point that we've got a plan we've got a rough design um you know what else do we need to think about in terms of you know where we put stuff how we manage it and it was it was kind of that that added horticultural complication that i think is the rest of it you could apply almost to anything but some of this stuff gets yeah. more difficult i mean the other way i like to, I, I like thinking about it ben is I slightly call it, I've got, I've got written in front of me, reality check. But the other thing, which I thought about as well, is it's about, quite often at this point, you'll be looking at a two-dimensional plan on a bit of paper, as if you're in a hot air balloon above a field. You know, like the Google Maps view, basically. That is just, that is two-dimensional in space, but it's also two-dimensional in time. And at this point, when you've got that two-dimensional view, you want to, in, uh, the best way I can use is animate it. So you want to kind of get within inside that system and view it, you know, get to ground level looking at it, you know, virtually in your head and imagine it going through 12 months and imagine it going through 12 years and imagine what crops are going to be on the ground and imagine what the trees are going to be doing at different times of year and what the crops are going to be doing at different times of year. So that's that's what I always think. And I think this is the most exciting part of, of the design process, basically. Yeah, and I mean, both Andy and I were inspired by a, a grower called Alan Schofield, who some of you may know, who is a grower up in Lancashire. He's retired now, but he had he inherited, I think, uh, an established pollarded alder um, agroforestry system. And I remember going up to visit him, and he he sort of had this unbelievably complicated rotation because he he understood which plants, which crops did best near the trees, but also which did near, best near the trees immediately after they'd been pollarded, and then year one and year two. So he ended up with these sort of, I, I mean, I don't know how he kept track of it, honestly, but um, but I guess after 30 years, he'd found a, a way for it to work. 
but but yeah, I mean that blew me away his system. Yeah, I mean it's, there's there's loads. I've always liked. There's a really good, and I think essentially that's that's the key thing, which is you take coppicing for example so in our system at the farm we we're going to coppice we've got a five-year veg rotation and we've got all doing hazel coppice which we're going to harvest in a five-year rotation so the instant choice there from a design process is at what point in the rotation do i want to lose my windbreak and gain a load of wood chip basically and the answer is not all at once so you know i could just like once every seven years harvest all of the alder and hazel have a hell of you know loads of wood chip make it all into compost use it for uh five years and then make a load more but that would that wouldn't help me with my wind original windbreak plan so that was the original design of the system so the way we've done it and it's called phasing um is we coppice in line with the second year of the rotation downwind of it so we lose our windbreak to the ground or part of it because it's a mixed tree line but we'll lose about two-thirds of the trees in the line so every other one sort of thing roughly but that will lose that in the second year of the rotation is when we cut it and that's when we've got a fully established second year cover crop now cover crops in their second year don't need windbreaks they're well established they've got deep rooting systems so many of the benefits that come from a windbreak you don't need you know i do need it in the first year because establishing a cover crop in modern summers is tricky. And if I can drop the wind, if I can drop the wind speeds, I drop the evaporation rates, I get first, I get faster germination and better establishment. So I, I, I have it for that establishment period. And I also want it back again when I grow squash and sweet corn. So we, we picked a certain point in the rotation to lose that windbreak and gain gain our wood chip, basically. So that I mean that's a really good example. The other really lovely example that I like to give of this is it's thousands of years old. And in the driest areas of China, there are people still using the system for arable, but it just, it gives the example of that animated seasonal um, behavior interaction between crops and trees. And that's the Paulonia or foxglove system that they use with arable. So the foxglove tree, comes out into leaf really really late its leaves are 70 percent nitrogen and when they fall to the ground they put that back into the soil but the key thing is that they use this system in a really hot part of china where they want maximum light in the spring on their arable crop to get it growing and get it where and get a good yield but it gets super hot and super intense sunshine in the height of summer so the trees come out and they've got huge leaves, foxglove trees. So they almost put this full shade protection over the crop just before harvest. So it doesn't like ripen too quickly. And apparently also so the workers can harvest in the shade. And then after they've harvested, it drops all the leaves and feeds the soil again. So it's that seasonal behavior. So obviously like with deciduous trees, there's a time of the year when they cast shade, heavy shade. And there's a time of the year when they cast no shade. So I remember um, Alan Schofield's system, he put spring over winter spring greens right on the side of the tree, uh, his rotation areas underneath the trees. Because when they did most of their growing over the winter in late autumn and early spring, the trees had dropped their leaves. So you were getting maximum sun sunlight next to those tree rows. I mean, it's a very complicated subject. And you could go on and on, but I, I think the key thing is to, to is to, you can use it to your advantage. So you can put things that want to be in the shade in the shade, and things that need maximum light in the light at the right times of year, basically. And how did you, when you were planning your system, how did you go about that bit? I mean, you know, because it's almost I don't know, it's sort of mind blowing just thinking about it. How did you so did you list the crops according to? I had a rotation already. Or? I had a veg rotation already. So that was, I, I say with everything I do on the farm, every new technique I learn, everything I learn, I use rotation to integrate it into my system. Rotation is the framework for everything I do. So when I design my veg system, the, the, the agroforestry system, the first thing I worked out was what was my intended veg rotation in that field, because that defined a lot of the things that I did thereafter, like how much crop mesh, you know, I, I, Crop mesh I use at different widths on different crops. Brussels sprouts, it'll only cover three beds of them. 
if it's you know um leaks or something it'll cover four beds so it defines everything so veg rotation first and then always sticking write down and remember what your original aims were because you can just go off down rabbit holes left right and center and especially when you start picking cropping things and you know, you go, I don't know where I'll send them, but I'm going to grow nuts, I'm going to grow fruit, I'm going to grow timber, I'm going to grow cricket bats. And so, you know, keep it simple. Keep it simple and, and give yourself, a, you know, it's the classic life stuff. Give yourself achievable aims. Realistically, what problems can you solve with trees? You, you don't, don't, try every, don't try and solve every single problem on the farm with one agroforestry system. Yeah, that's good advice, definitely. So I think <clears throat> broadly, I think that's sort of, we've come to the end of our questiony bit. There are definitely a couple of questions. We've got 10 minutes left. Um, and I've got one question from Ruth in the chat and two in the questions. So that might take us to the end anyway. Um, so maybe let's start with the, um, the hazelnut question. Are hazelnuts a practical proposition for nuts? I think in theory, yes, but yes, definitely squirrels are the challenge for sure um <clears throat> there are you know there are new uh traps you know for killing squirrels i think if you want to produce nuts you have to accept that you are going to have to kill squirrels um there's a there's a walnut grower in the cotswolds who i went and visited once and he told me one day so he his his walnut field was slightly separate to some other wood bits of woodland in the area and they just went along because you know, he watched them just go along the fence and up into his walnuts. He said one day he shot 43 squirrels coming across, um, you know, so so if you don't want to kill squirrels then probably don't try and produce nuts, I would say. Um, but yes, I think there is a market. I think I think nuts generally there's um, there's a massive potential to produce them. We import a huge amount of nuts. Nut consumption is going up. Um, and we, apart from some hazelnuts and a little bit of walnut, we don't really produce very much in this country at all. So, so there's opportunities, but I don't think it's, <clears throat> I don't think it's that easy. Uh, but the advantage potentially of agroforestry systems, particularly in field ones, is you can isolate them from the other trees. Um, so squirrels don't like going across a, open ground. Um, so if you've got a big enough headland. Um, you might well be able to keep them off your productive trees within the system um, in a way that you wouldn't if you just got a big area. They haven't found ours yet. We, we applied hazel for coppicing. Year five, year, what we year? The oldest hazels will be year five and they get hazelnuts on them and the squirrels, I've been watching really closely and it's very interesting. It's just the diverse, just diversity, you know, monocrop. Yeah. I always say, if you're a squirrel and you run into a field and the only thing in the field is nuts, of course you're going to have a problem. You know, of course they're going to find the nuts because that's all there is in the field. If you have a field and it's got, you know, 90 different species of tree or, or even better, 100, you know, 10,000 different species of plant in the field, any pest is going to find it harder to find its intended target. So again, you know, maybe if you want to do nuts, don't just do nuts. Do nuts and other things, and that is is a natural defence. I'm not saying it will yeah. solve it, but it'll help. And then, you know, and there is, you know, there's then all of that that sort of perennial challenge of growing enough of anything to make it worth growing and harvesting. Um, you know, within particularly within smaller systems, you know, we're you know we've got these sixty almond trees. Is that going to be enough to be a viable crop? Possibly not. Um, and yeah, like things like a lot of trees. Doesn't mm -hmm. it depends what your route to market is, you know, and the it volume. Does, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah um, so a question for Fred. Um, what would you recommend to cover leeks, cabbage, and cauliflowers with planted near mixed mature trees to leave the veg with less leaf or tree litter at the point of use? So am I right? Sorry, Fred, I may need clarification. So are you asking what types of trees are going to leave the least tree litter for when you're harvesting the brassicas? Is that right? I think. Does that make sense, Andy? I'm not, yeah. I, I, I presume he's not to talk about where you could cover them in mesh, but I don't think that's the question, is it? I think, I think the question is, is there a tree is there a tree that will drop leaves? But again, that'll be about timing, isn't it? And things like 
well, I suppose things like hornbeam hangs on to its leaves. Yeah. So, and beech to a certain extent hangs on to its leaves. So that might well be your answer there. Uh, no, he says, yes, mesh. Oh, right. Mesh then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah. I, I, that's, you, Fred. <laughs> I suppose, I mean, to be honest, there is, there, there's crop mesh, but then there is, you know, there's different kinds of mesh. So there's, you don't need really expensive enviro mesh to keep leaves off crops. You can use a much wider, cheaper mesh, um, like a bird mesh, essentially, which is that you get black, wider, you know, wider gauge meshing for birds. Um, that'll keep leaves off, and it's much, much cheaper than uh, enviro mesh. And and you know, the other bit, I guess, as well. Um, although I'm not a big fan of fleece, but you know, if you've got trees and the whole site is less windy, you might get away with something like fleece which you might not want to use on a very exposed windy site because it would just rip yeah you know, so there's that kind of dynamic as well um and then uh a question right what's your preferred spacing between rows of trees again i think it really depends on the size of the tree and the crop i think you know it's um i think starting with what you want to grow and and even you know you might go okay well, i'm going to grow apples are you going to grow apples on, you know, M25s and they're going to be 10 metres tall or are you going to grow them on a dwarfing rootstock? You know, my system that I planted um, on the <coughs> rented land that I had to dig up, you know, my idea was that it was all going to be trained fruit trees. So I was going to keep them to sort of six, eight foot tall. It was going to be intensively trained, hyper productive, um, you know, espalier fruit which is more management but more productive but i could then you know i could manage that height um and then <clears throat> i can't remember now how much, i think it was four meters or six meters between the trees and about eight meters between the, the rows so they were relatively narrow rows it was quite intensive but there's even um a colleague of mine saw a system in italy where it was a field of beans broad beans and they literally had step over apple trees you know two foot off the ground so just one, literally one trained, uh, you know, row, but but all across the field. So there were rows of these step over apple trees, but they were only two foot tall. Um, you know, so you, you can be really quite creative, I think, with some of this stuff. Um, but but that, you know, I think it, it, you can't give a definitive answer about spacing. Um, but I think that, you know, again, the north, south, east, west thing is, uh, Andy mentioned it a little bit at the beginning. So in terms of, you know, maximum or, or most efficient light use for the crops in between, you want north south because that way the, none of the crop is in shade entirely at any point. Whereas if you go east west, there's a risk, you know, in anything but midsummer that there will be a portion of the crop that doesn't get sun. And then, like, like we talked about, about this, we've been working on this diagram to demonstrate that for the book. And it's really important to understand, and I think off the top of my head, that the shade cast at midday on a five meter tree in the middle of winter is something like 30 meters. So th in the winter, th I mean, obviously it depends on whether it's deciduous or not and how much canopy there is, but it's a significant amount of shade on the north side of a tree. So if you're if it's winter cropping, you need to take it. Obviously in the summer, that's way less because the sun is way, way higher. Yeah. Um, but Ben, just to rewind to that thing about distance between tree rows. So again, like have yourself a checklist. What am I trying to achieve? So when we designed our system, it was about wind, two things, wind, and I wanted biodiversity because it's an organic veg system. So managing pests is really important. So the two bits of maths that affect tree row distance for that, and they happen to be very similar, and that's purely by chance uh, for me was, the effective range of a predatory insect uh, from, a, from a habitat is 50 meters. Um, a, five, a, a tree will cast wind shadow 10 times its height. So those are the two bits of maths that informed the row distance for me. So we ended up quite close to 50 meters because it gave us full insect coverage um, and it gave us the wind protection. We, we, we averaged out the height of our trees, maturity was going to be about five meters. Um, for the coppice at uh, five years and for the apple trees on M106. So that's, that was how, 
yeah, you will have your own parameters around your own priorities and system design. But yeah, learn learn a bit of the just the baseline maths around wind protection, you know, uh, routing distances compared to canopy distances on trees, things like that. The maths is really important for deciding the maths. Yeah. And so I mean, there's an extra point on that question where just <clears throat> the main task they want to do is prevent soil erosion and heavy rain. So, you know, so actually, you know, I'd be tempted on that to go for slightly fewer rows, but slightly bigger trees. You want, you know, you want some really good roots, I would say, to, to aid that infiltration down to, you know, to a deep level. So you could potentially go for, you know, again, I mean, you say, 10 20 acres of land but you know you could potentially have three rows or four rows of trees it wouldn't need to be as you know anything like as close as as andy's i would say um and and that would do enough to slow the water down and reduce it and, and it would get down into it um i mean you may want more so i'm not saying you know but it but it might be that that's that that's a way that would work for that but obviously you know i think i think andy's right i think getting to grips with the maths and the calculations is um uh is is you know vital really um so the so the yes <clears throat> so the, the, there's two questions right we're running out of time as well but anyway uh it's fine but are you all right to hang on for a few more minutes Andy? if we run over always mate yeah if people need to leave a, a bed on half past then obviously do but we can carry on for another five minutes or so um so there's a question about the distance from the veg to the tree row and again this is i think this is an interesting one it comes back a little bit to what he was saying about Alan's thing where he put the winter brassicas, you know, next to the trees. So it's it's what's what's the what is that interaction, particularly the interaction at the at the crop tree interface. Um, and it will, you know, it will depend on the species of tree, won't it? You know, if you've got so you know, you mentioned those pruner species, which tend to be shallower rooting and suffering, they're yeah. going to have big impact. Whereas something uh you know the, an apple maybe where it goes down more and, and now that's going to more on a slightly less vigorous rootstock it's going to have less of an impact and, and willow will have two different impacts it will drain a bit you know it, it will yeah. it will help you out massively in the winter and it can be a bit of a pain in the summer but again you're you're those are those interactions that you're planning for with that distance isn't it yeah and in my you know in my small intensive system i could be really close to those trees because i was pruning them all the time and and keeping their bigger down and they weren't hugely vigorous anyway but i wouldn't have gone that close if i was growing next to yeah willow or alder or something you know i'd go further away um and again i mean looking at the picture behind me is it three meter rows that fred's got i can't quite remember now um or is it two it, meters on each side or yeah i think it's, I, if i remember it's a slightly narrow mine of now mine will end up at four meters of maturity and i think fred's look if i remember right a little bit thinner so yeah that might be right yeah um and because he's got that permanent grass he's you know he wants to be able to drive up that bit to harvest you know so there's there's bits about you know what are you doing under the story is it is it literally i want to get as close as i can to the trees and maximize my cropping area or you know maybe if you've got a bit more space you could leave a wider row and and that sort of reduces that risk of of negative interactions happening so we ben we do a we have a blank bed either side of our tree rows as a kill zone for perennial weeds and right. we keep that we tend to weed it a few times early in the season and when we're happy we've knocked them back a, a, a fair bit We'll just let it green over. It's got its own seed bank of wildflowers in it. And we'll let it green over a bit of summer, but we'll always knock it back again once late summer. And then again, let it green over for the winter. But we never let it, I never really leave those rows untouched for that long. Because I just want to keep the any perennial weeds out of my cropping areas, basically. So that, I think that certainly partly <laughs> answers the question in the chat from Lyle about, is a notable increase in mechanization to manage the trees and their interaction with the crop so you know the that really mentioned root pruning but you know your your weed control bit is is effectively that i, um, I would have that at the edge of a veg field without the trees yeah but it fair. would but it would also you know because you're cultivating anyway 
you're you know you're effectively doing a bit of root pruning as yeah, part yeah, of that, 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 to a certain extent I, you know I, I always wonder about if we move away from plowing in any way which naturally does root pruning for organic field scale at the moment that might be there may be a point where we have to look for a different implement like some sort of subsoil with a blade or with a blade yeah you just run up i run up the side of the cropping area once a year or or actually on rotation you know it all depends how it's an organic system and everything's got to fit into that system and yeah you're with agroforestry you're thinking all the time about that interaction and it will evolve as techniques evolve but now my system has to evolve with trees in the thinking as well yeah cool well the only one we haven't really covered was philip's question about the sort of establishment and support and i wonder lizzie whether we need to um plan a future webinar around sort of that bit of it planting and establishment and um and maybe a bit more about understory management and some of that stuff because i feel like we don't have time to do to do that justice really at this stage but um they could each be a session in their own understories i think it's understory is a fascinating subject there's so many options with understory yeah. It's, um yeah so i think that's it thank you all very much it's been uh, i've had fun i hope you found i think you found it um useful Andy, I hope you've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it. I love it. Yeah, I love talking about it. I love sharing knowledge. I think it's, um, yeah, knowledge is for sharing. So thank you. So, yeah, thanks, Lizzie, very much for organising it. Thanks, Lizzie. Thank Have you, you both anything, so much. Uh, you need to add from the OGA point of view? Uh, no, no, I will put my, uh, if anyone wants to um, contact me, more ideas for... Um, webinars i'll put my email in the chat and you can just send them over but um yeah thank you and uh, can i just do a final plug as well for the agroforestry show that we're running in september that both andy and i are going to be at uh it's at eastbrook farm in um in wiltshire uh the agroforestry show.com i think is the website but um it'd be there's a there's a couple of horticultural sessions but lots of other stuff as well so yeah you can see some of the stuff we've been talking about I uh, hope you see something at the Skills Fair next week as well, if you're coming. Um, yeah, look forward to sharing a beer. Great. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Bye.